Hey guys, welcome back to episode two. I am so glad you can join us for this next episode and the cool things we're gonna be talking about. Man, I really need a cool intro for this series, like some haunting music or something. Uh, maybe I'll make something and stick something in here, but uh, for now, you'll just have to hear my voice for the time being. So today's episode, I actually wanted to go over some Skinwalker encounters. Since last week, we did a few Dogman encounters, and I think it's cool to switch it up and have variety. So today, we're going to be breaking down a few of those encounters, and kind of the same as last episode, breaking them down, finding out what's truth, what's myth, listening to each of these stories, and really stopping and pausing on the parts that need explaining. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start our first encounter. To start this off, there are zero bear, moose, or elk where I lived at the time. Background info. At the time, I was around 12 or 14, and I was with my friend who I'll call Kayla. We planned on going to a picnic in her pastures. As we walked up a smaller hill, Kayla pushed me to the ground and whispered to me, Do you see that? At least 20 or so feet away was a tall creature. It stood on four thin limbs and its head was narrow. Okay, so already he's mentioning about going into a pasture to have a picnic and they spot this creature that is four-legged. So now right off the bat, since we're talking about skinwalkers here, it's a little unconventional, so I'm not really sure, well, I don't even actually really remember this encounter to be honest, even though I read it probably about a month ago. Uh, but looking back, I don't honestly think that's really something conventionally you see with a skinwalker. Um, maybe with a dogman, but seeing something on four legs and then having a more narrow head, that sounds already more dogman-ish than a skinwalker, but uh, let's continue on the story. Similar to that of a horse or a deer, it was completely black. I couldn't make out features, but it had a mane just like a lion. Okay, so already again, he's mentioning the total blackness of the animal, the mane like a lion, it has a more narrow head. Uh, again, guys, this sounds like we're dealing with more of a dogman than we are a skinwalker. Skinwalkers are usually bipedal. Um, I'm terrible at thinking of a description the way I could physically describe a skinwalker. But I can definitely tell you that they are bipedal creatures. And hearing what these people are describing does not sound like a skinwalker at all. Um, it's very possible that they saw whatever it is they're seeing, since so far it sounds genuine. But I just, again, I think it sounds more like a dogman than anything else, especially with the key descriptions that they've just given us. Let's listen more. But it seemed flat and coarse. The mane, like fur, ran along its back, stopping near the rear. It had no tail. Here's a side note. All of the cattle were moved to a completely different area. Nowhere near this one. No other livestock animals were in those pastures. But this thing was just staring off. Suddenly, my friend stood up and made a beeline for the exit that was at least two miles away. I didn't hesitate to follow her. We finally stopped near the latched fence that led to her house and looked back. We had a pretty good view of the hill it stood on. It was slowly walking back into the trees. This still gives me chills to this day. Okay, so we kind of heard how he more described it. So end of the story, uh, I would probably classify this as truth. It sounds really genuine. Nothing sounds extremely made up. Uh, the story doesn't go in any weird directions that something like a creepypasta would. So I'm definitely going to classify this as it's probably truthful. However, like I've been stating, I don't think they saw a skinwalker, even though this story was sent to me as a skinwalker encounter and labeled as such. I honestly believe that they saw a dogman just based off the descriptions of the cryptid. I mean, guys, it, it's, it's, I mean, come on, it's there. It, it was black, it was on all fours, had a narrow shaped face, it had a mane. I mean, that right there is a pretty much a classic description of, of a dogman, at least one of the types. I know, I think it's Vic Hundiff who actually has the different types of dogman. I don't know if he came up with that idea, 
but I know he goes by that a lot. And I know there's like three different kinds, if I remember right. And comment below and, and uh, help me if I'm wrong here. But uh, I think like type one is supposed to be the, like the lean type of dogman. And type two is like the pitch black bodybuilder Arnold Schwarzenegger-esque dogman. And then the third one is supposed to be like a, a bear squatch kind of thing. It's supposed to be like a, a Sasquatch with a snout. Um, again, I, help me out here, guys. I'm just trying to go off memory. I actually haven't listened to that in a long time. So anyway, uh, what it sounds to me, if what I said was correct, that they might be seeing a type one. Uh, so that's very interesting that some people will confuse cryptids like that. It's something to listen out for when people are describing these animals. And it's just good things to look out for. So um, again, story is true, I would say. So let's move on to the next story. Okay, so Friday, 1.28 a.m., me and my friends decided to go for a drive. We sometimes like to go to the Yano Mountains to experience something that only happens in that area, paranormal and supernatural. Like any other time we do this, we go in my car and drive past Tome Hill. Going towards the mountains and park across from VHS about a mile and a half away. Then we sit and take in the scenic beauty of the dark desert. Starting by listen closely to anything and looking everywhere being hyper observant. At first we saw a light in the distance traveling flat on the desert land. Getting within about a mile away from us then disappearing altogether. Moving on from where we had, I mean, I just see something else. Driving through roads and flying by at least 30 miles an hour over the speed limit, we turned down a familiar road. This is where we knew that something was about to change me and everyone else. We all looked to the right side of the car, and we all saw what we believed to be something like a skinwalker. A massive black dog just hunched over at my car. All right, guys, so this is probably another misidentification, uh, probably being a dogman since they consider it a black dog. Now, here's the thing. I know with skinwalkers, a lot of the times that they'll take the form of a coyote or some sort of wolf. Uh, from what I've gathered, the shapes that they take after or when they supposedly shapeshift and turn into one of these things, uh, it's generally like a more kind of white brownish color. It's not really a dark, yeah, it's not really a dark color from what I've researched and gathered. The whole pitch black fur thing or darker than the, you know, the area around it, all that kind of thing, or where they describe the fur as absorbing light. That seems to be kind of like a proprietary dogman thing, or it's very exclusive to dogman. I have not really heard any other cryptid other than a Bigfoot, but more so dogmen have only been described, like literally only dogmen have been the only cryptids I've come across that have literally been described as having fur so dark that it absorbs light or that their fur is darker than the area around it. You'll hear it all the time in encounters. Like it's almost either A, B, or C for descriptions of their fur. Um, and I'm not sure why black is such a common color. Uh, and not just black, I mean like blacker than black that they just blend into the night. I'm not quite sure like why that's a thing. There have been some reports of dogmen uh, white and gray, um, brown and red, but it's very far and few in between. Go back and listen to pretty much all the dogmen encounters I've ever read and narrated. And I would say like eight out of 10 of them are, you know, I saw a black wolf looking thing or I saw a black werewolf or, you know, this, this creature was black. And I mean, I, I can go on and on, but... It's just, okay, so when you hear, you know, we were being chased by a black dog, already I'm thinking, okay, that's also something dogmen do. And again, that could just be based off my ignorance of skinwalkers because I know way more about dogmen and such because I've looked into it more, I've researched it more than I do skinwalkers. I also personally feel like there's a lot more material out there um, and partially due to Vic Hundiff show that there's more knowledge on um, dogmen than there are skinwalkers. Unless there's some sort of skinwalker podcast out there where they've interviewed dozens of eyewitnesses that I don't know about. And if there is, guys, link that in the comments. I want to know about it. But uh, So again, my knowledge is more minimal when it comes to skinwalkers, which is 
why I thought this episode would be fun to do. Um, so yeah, so again, I think that they saw Dogman. If you disagree, comment below and tell me why. So let's move on to the next part. While I was going 45 miles an hour through the road, we should have felt impact from the massive creature, but we didn't. Both people in the back seat looked and saw this thing rise up from the ground and stand straight up on two legs, absolutely huge and all black with red eyes that are forever imprinted in my mind. I didn't slow down, but sped up, going about 55 miles an hour now, so probably about 20 yards away they saw it rise up, as if nothing happened to it. Okay guys, I mean come on, it stood up on two legs, it had red eyes, it was huge, it followed their car. I'm going to say this was a Dogman encounter tried and true. Um, I honestly don't remember where in the story that they said they were. Um, but again, I'm I'm going to go with that. It was probably true. It sounds genuine. It sounds truthful. Again, nothing too far-fetched in the story. It was pretty streamlined as far as you know events and how they took place. And the way they described the creature was pretty, pretty honest and kind of matched what a lot of other people describe it as. Um, so yeah, I'm going to say it's a truthful story and probably just another misidentification as a skinwalker, but it was actually a dogman. Uh, again, just my opinion off based off what I know. If you guys disagree, please leave a comment and tell me why. I would love to hear from you. Uh, let's move on to the next story. Before I begin, I'm a 16 year old male. About three years ago, I was in Virginia visiting my family over the summer. We were right outside the D.C. area and staying in a two-story house near the freeway. On the other side of the freeway was a forest. So, my mom, her boyfriend Eric, and I were all staying with Eric's parents. We had brought some night vision binoculars and decided that tonight was the perfect time to use them. So, after dinner, we geared up and we headed out. We pass under the freeway and head into the woods. When we get about five minutes into the forest, we set down our bag and we take out our binoculars. My mom looks around with them for quite a while, seeing a few squirrels here and there. She gets tired of them and eventually passes them on to me. I look around for a while, being careful not to look at the freeway for fear of being blinded. I spot something, behind a tree about 50 feet to our left. I concentrate on it, trying to figure out what it is. It looks like a pale, bald, anorexic man looking straight at us from behind a tree. I get a bit uneasy, but I'm hesitant to believe it's really there. I ask Eric to take a look, just in case. To my despair, he sees it too. He describes it much the same way I did. Now, Eric is a former amateur boxer, and I train MMA almost every day. But neither one of us wants to stick around with that thing. Okay, so again, I'm going to say a third time of misidentification, but maybe not. So this sounds more like it might be a Wendigo uh, or a Rake to be exact. And I know a lot of people say, well, well the rake is creepypasta, the rake is made up, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's actually, gosh, you know, and I'm trying to remember the story, but there was like a an ex-Special Forces interview on YouTube that I had listened to a lot, like a ways back. And he had told me that the rake was actually a real creature and that the whole creepypasta thing was meant to be a deceitful campaign to you know, deceive people to think that it wasn't real and that it was made up and um, that he saw this, supposedly saw this creature, what they call the rake, and, you know, take down dogmen, like actual several of them, and kill these creatures and whatnot. So, um, again, that's just what this guy says. You know, who knows if he's full of shit or not. But uh, it's just interesting to hear his take on it. And, you know, this is a guy who dealt in, like, you know, military special forces and dealt with, like, CIA and government officials. And so... Anyway, take it with a grain of salt, like everything else, um, but it's just interesting. But anyway, when he mentioned the bald head, it honestly either makes me think, yeah, the ra you know a rake or um, a wendigo. And I, if I remember right, wendigos kind of shapeshift too. I'm, I'm really fuzzy with my wendigo knowledge, um, 
but it definitely I don't think is a skinwalker and I definitely don't think it's a dogman um, maybe some of you guys can comment and tell me what you think it is but I'll definitely say that again so far sounds true but I just think it's a misidentification and I think it's possibly a Wendigo so let's continue on we start heading back to the house crossing under the freeway we take another look behind us as a car comes by. All three of us see glowing eyes lit up by the headlights on the other side of the freeway. We say fuck that and we head back to the house. When we get back, Eric's parents are asleep and my mom and Eric go upstairs to the guest room. There's only one guest room, so I have the couch downstairs. I'm a little too excited after seeing the thing in the woods. So I end up staying up all night. Around 3 a.m., I'm watching TV and I start hearing footsteps above me. I immediately remember our earlier encounter and I panic a little. I try to calm down and tell myself it's just one of the dogs or maybe someone who couldn't sleep. I keep hearing the footsteps though, for a while actually, until I hear a doorknob jiggle. I find it weird that they're trying to open a locked door, but I try to ignore it. They stop, walk around for a few more minutes, and then it's quiet again. I stay up until the sun starts coming up, and then I pass out. My mom wakes me up, and I remember the footsteps from the night before. I describe what happened and ask if one of them got up at any time. She says no and I think it must have been one of the dogs. That is, until she tells me the room above me is the office. No one was in the office and the door stays locked at night. My heart sinks as I piece it all together. I don't know if it was that thing for sure, but I think it was. I've done a lot of research since then, trying to figure out what that was that night. I found two creatures that seemed to match it. I think it was either a skinwalker or possibly a wendigo. Whichever one it was, I'm just thankful that door was locked. I know I wouldn't be able to fight that thing, no matter how tough I am. Boom shakalaka. Okay, see, he says he suspects it's either a skinwalker or a wendigo. I think we could safely assume that it is not a skinwalker just based off his descriptions, based off how it acted. It sounds like the son of a bitch actually got into his house, which is terrifying. The poor individual, my gosh. Um, but luckily that door was locked. God only knows what would have happened if the door hadn't been uh, locked and it had been unlocked. So yeah, I'm glad he, uh, if the story is true, that he made it out. But guys, th this story, is, again, another, these are actually all really good uh, examples of stories that, lean really on the truth side um again you know nothing really out there nothing far-fetched everything was pretty streamlined everything made sense it followed evenly um and guys as, as you're listening to this i want you to pay attention to these stories too and listen for these details you know because you're going to come across some stories that you know they'll sound pretty truthful for a while or you may get two parts of the story where i'm like wait a minute you know but again just because certain situations and certain stories can have moments that are far-fetched shouldn't necessarily debunk the entire story. Um, but then again, you have stories that are just totally outlandish from beginning to end. Um, I've been sent stories that I actually never even narrated for the channel because they were clearly, uh, not only were they badly written, but I'm like, this, this isn't even real. I'm not even going to stick this up on here. So yes, even though I have marked things as true encounters before and sometimes... Some of you guys have been like, okay, well, that story wasn't true, you know, because of this and this. I don't believe it. I mean, yeah, I see where you guys are coming from. I try to put together stories in my episodes that all sound very similar, if that makes sense. So that would explain why um, in a lot of videos, you know, the descriptions or excuse me, in the specific videos um, of that batch of stories that the encounters are similar, the descriptions are similar, um, et cetera, because I try to like take batches of stories that sound the closest together and put it in versus having a bunch of stories that are all over the place. I feel like it sounds cohesive or excuse me. I feel like it sounds more cohesive as a video. Um, and again, th there are some stories that there are parts that sound a little bit outlandish, 
But in my opinion, guys, as long as the entire encounter isn't blatantly made up and, and totally outlandish, then I'll, you know, I'll put it in there because even if somebody who's, you know, a diehard doesn't believe it, um, I feel like there's still entertainment value to it. Even if sometimes you could be like, well, you know, maybe that's probably not true. Um, I'm not just a true encounters. I try to base things off, you know, just encounters in general, even if they are potentially fiction. Um, as long as they sound true, you know, I, guys, I listen to this stuff because I like the entertainment. I'm really into true encounters as well. But again, just reiterating why I choose to post the content I do. But I do try to lean more on the true side for you guys because it's more genuine and it's more uh, terrifying to listen to. Anyway, let's move on to the next story. So, so far, we have three true stories that I believe to be true. Uh, just from the way they sound and we'll see what the next two stories are like so let's do it to start this story off and to give a little insight about me i'm an 18 year old female who grew up in michigan and have lived in the country for as long as i can remember and for heads up in this this is a long story so please bear with me now back to the story on one particular hot summer weekend me and a couple of friends, including my boyfriend, let's call him Tony, and my older brother, let's call him Brad, decided we were going to do some camping for the weekend, since it was such a nice warm week. Tony's parents had owned a cabin way out in Ludington, surrounded by a huge wooded area with a personal lake and no neighbors for at least four miles. But... Being stupid teenagers, we didn't really think about that. All we were ready for was to party like any normal teenagers would. Well, after being there for two hours, our fun had started. Tony's friends had brought ton of alcohol and weed to last us for the weekend, so we wouldn't be bored since we had no service and only movies to watch. After it got around 12 a.m. and was pitch black, we had a huge bonfire going. It was a total of six people, including me and Tony. As we talked and laughed about coming up events in our lives, we were so distracted that we didn't even notice that my brother had literally frozen his eyes to one section of the woods. Mind you, we were all intoxicated and high at the time. All right, I just want to go ahead and say this right now because I feel like there's so many ignorant people in the cryptid community that are so quick to write stories off because somebody was high off weed or somebody wasn't, you know, in, intoxicated. All right, I feel like all of us, if not most of us, have dabbled with substances before, alcohol included, and possibly marijuana, depending on what state you live in and how old you are. Guys, let's be honest here. There's there's literally no level of intoxication from either marijuana or alcohol that you could be at to actually see a dogman or a Bigfoot or a Skinwalker. It's just impossible, guys. So when you have these people in the stores who, you know, they're like, oh, I saw X cryptid and I was stone cold sober or they're like, I never did drugs in my life. Personally, I feel like that's such an irrelevant detail to add and it's just, you know, or, or when you have those people that go ahead and be like, oh, you know, was he drunk or oh, was he high? Guys, again, there's no way you're gonna see a dogman being drunk and high, it just doesn't do that unless you're taking heavy doses of LSD, ayahuasca, DMT, mushrooms, psilocybin. Guys, it's impossible. There's no way. So I'm telling you guys out there now, if you're listening to that story that I just partially played, and if you're one of those people that gets to the point to where they're like, oh, well, you know, we were drunk and high. So for you to just write the story off, it's wrong. I mean, again, it's it's impossible to be that inebriated that you all of a sudden start hallucinating uh, the vivid details that people describe in their encounters, okay? It's one thing if you're super inebriated and you're in the woods and you might see a shadow moving or something. Yeah, okay, I, I can kind of play that off. But if you're extremely drunk and you know a dogman shows up 30 feet away from you and you could vividly describe it to me with details matching just about every other description, I think that's wrong that these people are written off because they weren't stone cold sober. Guys, you know, substances don't always work that way. I feel like people need to be more educated on that. Anyway, I kind of went off a little bit here on the side, but I feel like it's something that people should know about. And I feel like it's something people who 
haven't drank or smoked weed or done anything that I feel like you guys should know about because I would hate for you to write off an encounter or a story because somebody says, oh, I was drinking some beers at the time and for somebody to automatically write that off as, oh, well, then it's not true or, oh, then, then you know, you just, you were just drunk and you saw things. That, guys, that doesn't happen, okay? That's just not a reality, okay? So let's move on to the next part of the story. Eventually, our talking ceased when Tony realized his friend and my brother had an emotionless expression. Hey, dude, you all right? He asked Brad. Silence. Brad didn't reply or even make any movements that would indicate he heard him. After that, I started to get scared, as well as the other two girls there. It took a lot for my brother to act that way. Eventually, I was the first to catch on what he was excessively staring into a certain spot in the woods. I turned my head and followed his gaze the best I could. And when I finally caught on to what he was staring at, my heart dropped. There, right fucking there, was at first look a dog. At least, that's what I thought. It was some person's dog that had wandered off. But then my brain kicked in and I realized there wasn't neighbors for miles. So how could there be a dog? My mind started to race while Tony still tried to get Brad to speak even more. In one motion, this thing stood up tall. And when I say tall, I mean gigantic. It had to be at least six feet tall. Everyone has seen it then. How could you not? The other two girls and the other boy with us gasped as they finally grasped why my brother was still as hell. I don't know, y'all. It sounds like a dogman to me. The, you know, the hiding in the wood line, the standing up, the colors, the watching them. Guys, again, you know, it's if you know what to listen for, this is a textbook case dogman sighting already. So let's listen more. No one moved for what seemed like hours. Tony was the first to talk. No tail, he mumbled. No one heard what he said, but Brad. And I swear to you, when I say his eyes widen as big as pan saucers, that freaked me out immediately. What did you say? One of the girls had asked. It has no fucking tail. He hissed at her. My heartbeat stopped. He was right. There was no tail on this thing. Suddenly, my clouded alcohol mind cleared up in a fraction of a second when I finally realized that what this thing was exactly. Now, I understand why my brother was basically shitting his pants. This thing was a skinwalker. My instincts kicked in right then and there, but before I could nope the fuck out of there, this thing let off a terrible stench like rotting meat before screaming inhuman-like. So now this is kind of interesting. Again, guys, the story is sounding really truthful. Um, again, all the details are lining up, so that's really good. Uh, I feel like I picked a good batch of stories to do for this episode that are all very truthful. Um, but the descriptions are really interesting. So, so far that they mentioned everything that would lead me to believe that it was a dogman. But then they talked about, you know, the, the smell of rotting meat. Um, something that's really common with dogmen is I'm sure if many of you have listened to, uh, Vic Hundiff's encounters that a lot of times you'll notice a similarity with smelling rotting meat and wet dog. Okay. Those two like are hand in hand. If you, if you smell that, you know, you better get on your knees and start praying because that means one of these things is really close by. Um, but they had just mentioned the rotten meat smell. Now, I don't know too many skinwalker encounters that they smelt rotten meat, so uh, I'm not actually too sure on this one, but they didn't mention anything about the wet dog, so it could definitely be a dogman, but then the inhuman screech, I don't know if they're maybe referring to a howl. I don't know if dogman let out an inhuman screech. Like I don't know how that works, but... Uh, I'm still gonna stick with what I said earlier, being it you know a dogman. So yeah, let's let's listen more. The sound was enough to scare the hell out of everyone. 
my brother, was the first up out of his chair and started shouting native words out to the creature and why I told everyone to get the hell inside. No one questioned me when they seen just how dead serious I was, especially Tony. He's never seen me so scared, so he knew it was a bad situation. We all hightailed it into the cabin with my brother in tow, still shouting native words at the creature, which seemed to keep it at bay, while I gave us enough time to get inside. He slammed and locked the door before turning all the lights off and grabbing a special ash from the kitchen counters and started throwing it at every window and door, all while chanting. Of course, he had everyone freaked out and basically in tears at that moment. After he was done, no one said a word for a long time. All of us were still in shock. He grabbed our dad's pistol and had it posted by him for hours. Everyone was entirely too shaken up to even question what happened. We must have fallen asleep eventually because I woke up to my brother packing all of our stuff into two cars early in the morning. I understood why. We had native family. We knew what we were dealing with, and we knew it would come back. And maybe, just maybe, not alone. Before we left, I did a blessing on the cabin and spoke a few calming words to the still, very freaked out young girls. We left as soon as everything was packed up. To this day, we still haven't explained exactly to our friends what happened that night, and they never bothered to ask us either. Okay, guys, so uh, the finale of the story, again, I'm going to say the story's true. Uh, it still sounds like a dogman to me, but let me interject with something that I find really interesting. Um, with skinwalkers and dogmen specifically, there seems to be this really interesting unity and similarity of just having this attachment to, to natives. Um, for example, skinwalkers, I mean, Navajo, uh, there's so many connections and ties to that culture. And then you look at something like dogmen, and then again, what do you see? You see a lot of ties to the whole Indian burial mound thing, okay? Now that's supposedly because that there's like stairs in these burial mounds that lead downwards. Um, again, that's just hearsay. Take it with a grain of salt. Uh, look into it more. A lot of people think that's a lot of load of hoo-ha. I don't know. I haven't looked too much into the whole burial mound thing enough. I've heard things, uh, but it's something you guys should go off and trail off and research yourself to get a better understanding of. Um, but anyway, I'm just, it's an interesting similarity between skinwalkers and dogmen that they both have ties to the whole native thing and native culture and uh, all that. So when you hear that in the story, it's definitely either skinwalker or a dogman for sure. But I would definitely say it leans more toward dogmen. But you know what? I could be wrong, you guys. I could definitely be wrong. So, but all in all, I would say so far we have four, in my opinion, true stories. That, uh, again, sound more like dogman sightings than anything else, but this is good. This way you guys can listen to this and learn how to identify properly what's what and be able to go from there. So let's move on to the last story, you guys. I'm having a hard time remembering the stories told to me by my Navajo family. But when I Skype with them again, I will ask for me. Boom, Navajo family. I can tell you already that this is probably guaranteed 100% skinwalker. Let's listen. This creepy set of events happened directly to me, though. So here it goes. My first personal encounter. I know it's lengthy, but hey, skinwalkers. They do require a backstory. It started when my two brothers, who we'll call David and Luke, and Luke's girlfriend, who we will call Sarah, all drove down to the desert to spend some time out in the country. This is reservation land, as it were, so red dirt was everywhere. This was in southern Utah, a majestically beautiful place if you ever get the chance to visit. We had some pistols and decided to go out and target practice. We took our gear and some old targets to a place called Devil's Heartbeat. 
Something to interject with right here that I think is really interesting. Uh, I think it's David Polites that wrote the book. Um, but for anyone who actually knows this book, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a book called The Devils in the Details. Okay, I'll say it again, The Devils in the Details. And it talks about all these places in America that have the name devil in it. You know, like the Devil's Punch Bowl, the Devil's Forest, the Devil's Mountain. Uh, he just mentioned the devil in a name. I can't remember what he just said. But um, anyway, the, the book goes on to describe how there's all these weird cryptid paranormal stuff that happens at these places and they're actually given that name for a reason it's not just the devil's thing for something um i know a lot of times people will say oh well you know there's folklore attached to it yada 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 but uh i don't know it's just an interesting read if you guys ever get a chance to look that book up and read it it's rather interesting i had never been but all three of them were familiar with the area it was a canyon about 200 or so feet deep we stayed on one end of the canyon by the drop-offs, and to our left was the ravine. About 50 feet over, the opposite side of the canyon rose up above us, where some other ruins were. The Navajo may disagree with historians on the Anasazi's origin and departure. According to Navajo legend, they simply disappeared from existence, leaving behind plates dishes, food, and went into another dimension, or some equivalent. But, whatever the history, the Navajo do not like to wander in the ruins. I never asked why, but figured it had something to do with disrespect, preserving history, etc. As such, none of the others cared a bit about these canyon ruins. They were more interested in shooting pistols. I could see old beds, ladders, and even cave drawings on the cliffs with just my naked eye. And I got this strange, strange fixation on going over there. I'm not Navajo, and felt that their rules didn't apply to me. I set down the cliffs without a rope and decided I would climb down, cross the canyon floor, and then climb back up. This was a bad idea for a million reasons, but it was just like some obsession. I can't explain the feeling. It was the magneticism. I wanted to be in those ruins, and it wasn't just a touristy-like curiosity. It felt like I was meant to go there. I kept slipping and kept getting stuck on the rocks. I was so frustrated I almost started crying. Finally, I was deterred by the unmistakable sound of a growl coming from the canyon floor below me. There were trees down there, so I couldn't see what was making the growl, but a mountain lion immediately rose to my mind, and I got my ass back up to the cliffside. I said nothing to the others, and we shot guns for a while. The only other strange occurrence was while Sarah was aiming, things got eerily quiet. We all heard a sound from behind us, maybe 20 feet away. It was almost a growl, but then a hoarse laugh, almost like a lion, and then a hyena. So already right there, uh, the story is sounding pretty truthful again so far. That's pretty good. Uh, this round, we've had five stories that all seem to match um, a very honest retelling of an actual encounter. Uh, this one definitely leads me to believe it is a skinwalker. Now, he had mentioned climbing down and hearing that growl. And even though that could have been a mountain lion or written off as something else, it's interesting to note that he also just mentioned now that he's hearing other strange animal noises like a hyena and then a horse um, and a growl. And these are things that are also pretty common with skinwalker encounters since skinwalkers tend to take the form and shape of other animals. So already right there that what he's describing in the story is pretty key to leading me to believe that this is a genuine real skinwalker encounter. We had a clear view of the entire area and there was nothing, certainly not on the cliff tops where we had heard it anyway. The creepy part was that while David, Sarah, and I all heard it from a close distance, Luke heard the exact same noise right by his ear. We ended up camping out there to see if anything would happen, and this is when I got completely terrified. 
Before, I was only scared of wild animals. We had guns, though, and were sleeping with no bags or tents. Just some blankets under the stars, and a little flare, so I felt safe when we all laid down. I fell asleep pretty quickly, but woke up a few hours later to see everyone else lying with their eyes wide open, listening. The canyon was completely full of noise. The only way to describe it is people banging rocks together. There would be one set maybe 300 yards away, then another clocking 200 yards away, and then 50 yards away. The canyon echoes, so it was hard to tell exactly how many rock smacking rock noises there were going on, but they sounded like Morse code. We listened to this for maybe 10 minutes. No other animal noises. Nothing. Finally, David, who is kind of a hard ass and the least superstitious, shouted, Shut up! And everything immediately stopped. My heart was in my throat. We just sat there and stared at one another, wide-eyed. It was dead quiet. And then we heard another super weird noise from the ruins. I don't know how to explain this one either, but it kind of sounded like a zebra noise, like these squeaky trills. It got louder, and then the rocks, sticks, whatever they were, started up again. But this was worse, because now other animal noises came. Guys, this is like a classic Skinwalker encounter already. He's talking about the rocks clicking together, and he's talking about hearing these weird zebra shrills and noises. Um, this is, a, like I said, a classic Skinwalker encounter. These things are coming from the ruins, which are supposed to have this strange paranormal power. I mean, if you guys look up Skinwalker encounters, um, I mean, you could use Google and check out multiple stories through there. I know Reddit has a ton of really cool Skinwalker encounters. If you look back, uh, I believe it's in the Skinwalker thread. Um, I know Amazon, there's a lot of books that are written that have compiles or compilations of Skinwalker encounters. There's so many stories for you guys to sift through and like look at. And if you read like 20, 30, 40, you'll kind of notice similarities in what people recount that they hear. Um, and animal sounds and weird things like that is a huge one, especially it goes, you know, hand in hand with the shape shifting. And then you pair that with the whole native uh, culture and the fact that this is in a paranormal area that's supposed to be really taboo and off limits. I mean, guys, it's, it's, I'm pretty convinced that this is a genuine skinwalker encounter or a skinwalker experience as he's uh, retelling. So I think it's really cool so far. Uh, let's see what happens next. We heard what sounded like wolves or coyotes barking, monkeys screeching. In my opinion, those were the most terrifying. Owls hooting, and through it all, the terrible zebra noises. Guys, do I need to say more? I mean, come on. If, if so far this is not a skinwalker, then I don't know what a skinwalker is anymore. This is textbook case skinwalker, guys. I mean, it just, it's incredible. We said nope and got our happy little asses out of there immediately. It took us maybe 10 minutes to douse that fire, pack our blankets, and speed away, and the noises were continuing the entire time. That night, I was obviously pretty shaken up. Before I could fall asleep again, my Navajo mother came and sat by me and said that she could tell I had a rough day. We hadn't mentioned the creepy shit to avoid a lecture about fucking with spirits. She asked me about it, and I ended up spilling my guts about not seeing the canyon ruins. It was something personal. It felt like it. I wanted to go there, so why couldn't I? It would have been beautiful. After I told her all about it, I could see that she had a really concerned look on her face. What is it? I asked, totally confused, and she explained something I had no idea about. The spirits in the ruins like to lure people up. When they get up on the ground, the spirits push them off. That's why we don't go there. I remained creeped out for the remainder of the visit. The town has a public access kiva 
kind of a tourist trap for a little podunk place, but since I didn't see the ruins up close, I went down into the kiva, and I went alone, as of course my superstitious family refused to enter other natives' dwellings. I figured that nothing could push me off a cliff if I was in a kiva. I was right, but something even worse happened. Fast forward to a few weeks later, I worked a shitty call center in Salt Lake City, third shift. It was my first night alone and I was feeling jumpy ever since the kiva. My brothers already warned me that I had a skinwalker following me, but of course didn't believe it. I don't smoke, but I followed my coworkers out for smoke breaks because I'm talkative and I like to chat. Tonight, I lurked in the doorway because I had this horrible cloud of dread hanging over me. I was peeping out the glass door and being a total weirdo. It hit me then how paranoid I had been. That's what skinwalkers do. They mess with your mind. While I was pacing on the front of the glass doors, I decided that this whole thing was stupid and I was going to go outside and stand there for the rest of my 10 minute break. Most of the smokers were already filling back in, but I walked out and put my hands in my pockets, looked at the sky, looked at the building, mentally patting myself on the back for not being a pussy. Then I saw something that I will never be able to give a rational or even halfway accountable explanation for. We have like six parking lots in one of the lots far away from me, maybe 100 feet, I could see something walking. It was a dog, obviously, but it was almost limping and walked like it was tired or hurt. Animal lover me forgot all about skinwalkers, and I started walking toward it, making the come here doggy noises. And then I stopped abruptly. The dog had the body form of a greyhound, and it was grey, but there was something very very wrong with it. It had bloody legs and limped, but it walked more like a person would on feet and hands. Its butt was moving to and from, if that makes any sense. When it heard me, it just stopped without turning, something I've never known any dog to do. And finally, it looked over its shoulder at me. And this is the freaky part. This dog was looking at me the way a person does. It had huge eyes, way too big for a greyhound, and its teeth were bared like it was considering biting me. Then it growled, but it was like a whistle growl, noises no regular animals make. It almost sounded like it wanted to talk to me, or was taunting me. Somehow, in the middle of all of this, I realized that it didn't have a tail, and I'd heard from all the Navajo stories that skinwalkers when they appear as animals, don't have tails. Forgetting all logic and rationale, I turned and jetted. I didn't look back until I was back inside the building and had pulled the door shut behind me. And by then, when I looked, of course the thing was gone. When I described this to my brothers, they were absolutely sure it was a skinwalker. And they went through the trouble of blessing me, my apartment, them and their apartments, I never saw the creepy, bloody dog again, and I have never even slightly wanted to visit. The okay, Cliff guys, Ruins. obviously, really cool encounter. It was a little lengthier, but still really good. Um, again, I'm going to go ahead and say that this is a really genuine, true encounter. Um, everything this person described was so skinwalker to the T that it was perfect. So let's recap a little. So the first four stories are definitely a lot more. On the dogman side of the spectrum, I would personally say, or maybe just misidentifications. Uh, whereas this story, this is pretty skinwalker down to the meat and bone. I mean, you have the animal noises, you have the the ruins, you have the paranormal aspect to it, and then you have this part too, where you know it follows her to her work and shows itself. I mean, one big thing that you'll people who are very knowledgeable about skinwalkers and how they work. Uh, they do follow people. And I think people have talked about, you know, if they 
I don't know how it happens, but I know that they can become attached to you and they follow you around and they haunt you and terrorize you. And I don't know if there's a blessing or how you get rid of it. Um, I don't know if, if you call their name or you do something to have them do this to you, but either way, she must have provoked it and it followed her to her work. And I mean, guys, it's, this is, it's actually kind of disturbing. I mean, even the dog that she saw was kind of like deformed looking, it had bloody legs and uh, it just, it didn't look right. It looked more human. I mean, when we're talking about skinwalkers and shapeshifters, they look weird and you know, that they're not going to look right and their behavior, the having no tail. I mean, there's so many things that I can mark down for this story that I'm like, man, if, unless this person heavily studied skinwalker stories, I, it's pretty genuine, you guys. I mean, it's pretty truthful. So I'm going to wrap up this story and say, it's not only a great story, but it's a great example of an honest, true skinwalker encounter. All right, everybody, that pretty much wraps up episode two. I'm so glad you were able to join me today to look at these five encounters with skinwalkers. And the next episode will probably be covering Bigfoot or some other cool creature encounters. So you want to stay tuned for that. I'm going to try and be releasing these every Sunday is kind of my uh, what I'm aiming for. So kind of what I have planned out for my channel is Monday through Friday, there will be encounters. Saturday is always a compilation of some kind. Uh, whether it be dogmen, creatures, whatnot. So you'll always see a compilation on Saturday. And then Sunday will be the Encounters Debunked Series Day, okay? And that's just kind of loosely based, but you can kind of uh, kind of account for that and look around for those dates. So, so I will see you guys all next weekend, hopefully, in Episode 3, where we look at some creature encounters and hopefully some Bigfoot encounters. Thank you so much, you guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Have a wonderful day.